Hi, thanks for tuning in. I'm Danny Hill, the monk on a motorbike. Today I'm talking to Venerable Chanda Vasudhi. Venerable Chandra is a Buddhist nun in the Theravadan Thai forest tradition. Born and raised in England, Venerable Chanda went to Asia at the age of 19 where she discovered Vipassana meditation. She spent the next 10 years practicing with her teacher S. N. Goenkaji at his centers in India before becoming a nun and moving to Burma to deepen her practice and commitment to the Dharma. Here she came across the teachings of Ajahn Brahm, an English monk based in Australia, and she moved over to study with him in Perth, Western Australia. Under his supervision, she received the training and rules to become a bhikkhuni or fully ordained Buddhist nun. Although the Buddha gave women full ordination when he was alive, the practice has since died out and women have been denied proper training and status for centuries. However, the bhikkhuni order is now being revived in some parts of Asia and in the Western monastic community or Sangha although it's been condemned by many, particularly in Thailand. On the face of it, this may seem quite niche and of interest only to the vo those involved in Buddhism, but actually many see it as a huge victory for gender equality around the globe. Asian Buddhism is traditionally very patriarchal, with monks enjoying a much higher status than nuns, who for centuries have been viewed as secondary to their male counterparts. Spiritual life is arguably at the core of any culture and is often seen as the driver of positive change. In a world that seems to be out of control, restoring the feminine to its rightful place in spirituality is an important move in the efforts to restore balance to the world at a time of crisis. So, Venerable Chanda. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Thank you for agreeing to take the time to talk to me. And um, I just wonder if you could tell us a bit about yourself and who you are and okay. where we are. So I'm supposed to be a Buddhist nun and I always kind of shied away from the word Buddhist but now I'm in robes I can't really avoid admitting that I must have some connection to the Buddha because my interest in the Dhamma came through meditation initially rather than through the Buddha's teachings as a religion and I guess I still don't see them that way really. I see this as a path you know of purification of, of uh, purifying the body, speech and mind and a path to happiness. So um, my interest in understanding the way the mind works and the meaning of life, you know, and how we can generate this happiness that's a deep inner happiness, um, came around through uh, probably in my teens and led me to India where I first contacted the Dhamma in uh, meditation courses with SN Goenka. So they're the hardcore Vipassana retreats where you sit for 12 hours a day. And uh, I found it really fascinating to see how my mind responded to that and how I would either cause my own suffering through the way I reacted or I could actually look at things in a different way, through a different lens and find a way to make peace with my own mind and my own body. Um, and so right from then I decided I wanted to ordain as a nun and it took quite a lot of years to find an opportunity to do that. So in the meantime, I was practicing a lot and giving service in many meditation retreats. And then in 2006, I heard about a teacher in Burma who ordained nuns and, uh, and went to Burma to take my first ordination. So I lived there for about four years. Um, and then after that, I, I left Burma because my, of stomach problems from living in Asia so long and uh, went back to Europe and eventually found myself in Australia with my current teacher who is Ajahn Brahm, um, quite a well-known and renowned, almost infamous you could say, uh, <laughs> monk who's originally from England but uh, has been living in Australia since I think 1984. Um, and he's sort of infamous really for ordaining nuns and giving them the full ordination. So until this point in my monastic life I'd only received a sort of um, semi-ordination um, so I was a novice nun, but it was quite difficult to get the support of lay people outside of that sort of understood, established um, ordination platform. So nuns are very much still inferior to monks in, in the Theravada tradition. Um, so Ajahn Brahm kind of took a big step and it was a risk because it went against a lot of the elders in his tradition at that time who were quite resistant to giving women the full ordination. And, uh, and because of that, he was so-called excommunicated, which I think is a strong word, but um, his monastery was no longer associated with the other monasteries in that particular branch of Thai forest um, Buddhism. 
And so in 2014, I had the opportunity to take the full ordination and lived in Perth for several years before he asked me to come back to England and establish a place for women here so that they could take the full ordination as the Buddha intended. So for the last uh, four years, I've been putting the groundwork, the foundations down to develop England's first monastery for bhikkhunis. That's fully ordained nuns in the Theravada tradition. Wow. Wow. I'd I'd like to drill in deeper to quite a few bits and bobs on that. But Uh I think firstly, particularly for people listening, if you could elaborate on the processes of ordination and what was going on before and and what's changed now in terms of differences in ordination. Okay. um, For, For women. For women, yeah. I mean, this is really a beginning for women in the Theravada tradition. So I think the first, I'm not the best with the facts and the history of this, but I think the first ordination en masse for women seeking the higher ordination in the Theravada tradition was in the late 90s in Bodh Gaya, I think 96, and then another in 98, but I'm not 100% sure of those dates. And that was uh, women from all over the world who came to Bodh Gaya to take the higher ordination. But at that time, because it wasn't available within the Theravada tradition, they took the ordination from Mahayana bhikkhunis. So that's a different tradition of uh, Buddhism. But the Vinaya and the ordination procedure is almost identical. So so that made it viable, and that made their ordination viable. Um, And since then, there have been, I think, about another thousand bhikkhunis ordained in Sri Lanka, but very few in the West. I think the first um, Western nun to ordain was Ayatata Loka, and she is now a senior bhikkhuni who has a monastery in California. Um, it's still a fairly small monastery. They have a, a, a sangha of maybe four or five uh, women. I think there were four nuns and perhaps a couple of novices. So these things are growing gradually, and there are a few monasteries in America um, of a similar size in California, so that's quite a progressive part of the world. Um, And then the other main change has been the ordinations that Ajahn Brahm presided over in Perth. And now in Perth there's a monastery with about 11 bhikkhunis. So although, you know, this is becoming a possibility, it's still a very rare opportunity for most people. Um, So in Burma you're allowed to take the ordination of either 8 or 10 precepts, um, which enables you to live a monastic life, but it... It does deprive you of the status given to fully ordained monks and therefore some of the support that they receive. So whether through society in terms of medical treatment or things like getting on buses, monks can get on buses and they're recognised as um, renunciants and so they don't have to pay the bus fare. But for women, they may not be recognised and people assume that they still have the support of the family. So they see you as kind of semi-monastic, semi-lay, Um, But in Burma for myself, I had all the uh, opportunities to practice as, according to the full training laid down by the Buddha, despite not having the official ordination, I had the conditions for practice, so I was very happy about that. It was only really after leaving because of my health difficulties that I realised there's nothing there, there's no system there to support me. So it was a struggle to survive in the robes. You know, whereas for monks, there are many, many monks monasteries for them to go to and choose from. For women, there are hardly any. And sometimes you don't resonate with a certain community, so you need to have a choice. So um, it's a beginning, you know, there's a beginning made, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done further. So, yeah, it's starting to happen. Again, just sort of a few technical details. For people listening, precepts are the rules, aren't Uh they? The the, the ethical rules. Right. Um, So initially you could take five precepts or eight precepts. Eight or ten. Eight or ten, ten. so that's right. And now, yeah. if you could just expand... What, oh, right, what, now what there's 311. So it's the quite, monks get 240 Yeah, 227. So you guys get even more, don't exactly. you? Exactly. And, and from the monks' perspective, they've always said, oh, you know, we take so many more precepts, that means we're a better field of merit, so to speak. You know, if you support us, you get better comer from that. So now I like to say, yeah, you know, we take 311, so what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a competition. <laughs> it's not a competition. Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of these things, you, you mentioned the word ethical precepts. Not all of them are actually ethical precepts. Some of them are sort of conventions and trainings that we do to kind of further our mindfulness. So practices such as the way we um, greet and respect each other, show respect to each other, um, you know, deportment, how we uh, enter rooms, sit down, pay respects. 
And then there are refined things such as, you know, showing respect or, or aspects of speech, which are, which are quite subtle. Um, the main difference between, um, what are the main differences? Because all monastics, at least from 10 precepts upwards, don't have the money. So that's the main hallmark of a Theravada monastic, that we don't use money, we don't own money. So that's where the real renunciation begins, right? So that's for a novice or a fully ordained monastic. But for a fully ordained nun, there are also things in there that give us extra support. So we have to, um, we're supposed to take guidance from the monks' sangha every two weeks. So there's some accountability on, on the part of the monks' sangha uh, to, to guide and take care of the bhikkhunis and make sure that we are receiving good education. And then also we have the possibility to chant and recite the full Patimoka, which are the whole 311 training rules for nuns, um, every two weeks, if we have a community of more than four bikinis, so we can do that. And we can basically run and guide our own communities, that's the main difference between you know, being a partially ordained and you know, dependent on a monk's community and being fully ordained and able to establish our own communities. And then the other difference comes um, through being able to ordain other women. So when a bhikkhuni has been ordained for 12 years, then they can ordain other bhikkhunis. So this means, of course, that we're able to start developing and expanding our own communities in the way that we feel is congruent for us, rather than when the monks decide uh, another nun can come into the community. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so yeah. it gives you greater independence mm -hmm. as nuns, it also changes your social status, if you like. Mm -hmm. And from, does it does it improve? Is, is it is it an improvement in your training? Are I those think in, training opportunities yeah, now? I think it does actually. Yes, because all the um, conventional rules, you know, and sort of uh, having to remember all those rules increases mindfulness. It's an opportunity to increase your awareness of what you're doing, how you're doing it, whether it's uh, in line. And, and also it kind of uh, accomplishes a sense of um, concord and uh, collaboration because you're all practicing the same way. So there's, an under, there's uh, something that's understood between the different bikinis. The other aspect of it that I think is important is uh, that we can go to any other bikini monastery in the world, whether Theravada or Mahayana, and our ordination is recognized as valid. So we're able to join in um, other communities, patimokas, so recitations of the rules, and you know, kind of discuss the training, discuss the areas that we struggle with or the areas that we're stronger in. And each community will practice it slightly differently. So it's not so much a fixed kind of um, rule book, it's more a training. So we attempt to train according to these guidelines, but then one important thing is to notice where your weaknesses are and to be able to bring that up with your fellow bikinis. So that's, I think, the most important part of it. Mm. Yeah. But I, I, I was yeah. talking to somebody about this the other day and I said, well, you know, part of the thing with bikinis, they had more rules and there's right. fewer rules yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and they're talking about the winning and they said, oh, wow, so, so now they're making life even more difficult for themselves uh -huh, with uh -huh, all these rules. Uh -huh. And I thought, and I wonder if you could just talk about the... Yeah. the why the rules are so important mm. for training because to okay. an outsider it might yeah. sound like we're well, just making like it more difficult yeah why, why do you want to do that when you just want right. to get on with meditation right, you know, right, what right, do right, the right, monks right. and nuns do so yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little yeah. about that yeah I think the idea of um, taking the training rules is not to complicate life but to simplify because it gives a very clear system of training. And so once you get a feel for this, it becomes quite natural. I never think of the rules in terms of individual rules. I think the more you practice the meditation, the less likely you are to break any of these things anyway, because the mindfulness increases. But these just serve as little reminders and little kind of tips in a way, and a container that's recognized for everybody. So there's more chance for like mutual feedback and, um, um, yeah, what was the other question? Just what, what, how, how having more rules oh, could, okay, yeah. could be how beneficial How people might training. think that that's um, complicating things. Mm. The idea is that uh, you don't have to constantly think about what should I do in this case, you know? Do I need the food offered in this way or in that way? There's just a, an understood way of doing it that you know, makes life simple for everybody in the community. It's like you don't have to keep reinventing the, the wheel. 
Um, and so when you sort of learn to fit into that and to settle into that, it makes life very simple. It's like the physical and practical things are taken care of and you can work on refining the, the mental side of the practice. Yeah. My, my tiny experience yeah. of it, I've, I've found having so many rules made it... Mm -hmm. It meant you had to think about everything you did. It made you more mindful because yeah, yeah, you right, you yeah. risked breaking a rule, so you had right, to be okay. more considered. That was that seemed to be um, so yeah. improve mindfulness yeah. in that way as yeah, well. Yeah, I think it can do. Yeah, Would that. I guess so. I mean, I think for me there wasn't a big shift from being ordained in Burma to being ordained as a bhikkhuni because I had the conditions to practice most of those things anyway. So by the time I read about the rules, it was like, well, I'm doing that anyway. So there was very little I actually needed to change. It had become quite internalised and quite natural. Yeah. And how did you find those restrictions initially? Because it is, you know, you as you say, yeah. you can't have the money, you can't really make a cup of right. tea or cook right. or anything. Can right, you? right, right. I mean, that very much depends on the situation that you ordain into. So for me, I always look... I didn't ordain until I knew the conditions were in place to support that kind of lifestyle. So most of the time, your monastic life depends very much on an established community where those things become easy because there's already support in place. You know, there's people there who do cook and there are people there who drive you or, you know, and there's, mon there's uh, money in the monastery from the fundraising that people have done or just from the donations that people offer. So most of the time, when you join an established monastery, it's very easy to keep the rules. You know, and the whole group's doing it, so you just fit in easily. Um, but of course, that means that you don't have your independence in the same way. And I think the time came in my practice when I felt that having too much independence was a hindrance because I could still kind of wiggle my way out of things I didn't really like, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, the weather's a bit hot here. I'll go to that meditation centre. That's really nice. They have good food there. Oh, here it's a bit more spicy, so I'll avoid that one. Oh, my friend's going over here. Let me go over here for a bit. Now I don't feel like it. I'll go trekking, you know. So I really wanted to have a little bit more of a renunciation and a kind of surrender to being in a given situation and working through whatever came up in my mind and in my practice. So I feel like I was ready for that. I was kind of gradually preparing myself for 10 years before I ordained initially. Um, and in Burma, I didn't need to handle money, really, because things were taken care of by the monastery. And we used to just get in buses anyway, whether they recognised that we were nuns or not, and say, well, we're nuns. So most of the time they accepted that, <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, when it came to coming back to the West, that was a bit more tricky. And I had a companion who actually used to handle the money, so I didn't have to do it much there either. Um, but I think it's best if you get a feel for these things naturally first so that it doesn't feel like too much of a straitjacket because then it can just, you know, you can be approaching it from the wrong angle and it can feel too tight. And also in learning to live with them, I think you need to sort of not, like I say, not see them as rules or something that's superimposed by some sort of like authoritarian agent, but rules that are there for your benefit and that the Buddha laid down out of compassion. So we need to learn how to apply them with wisdom and compassion in a given situation, you know, and not be very dogmatic and rigid about them. Because the Vinaya was always a living thing. It, it arose in response to situations in the Buddha's day, you know, and some of the rules feel quite archaic in a sense, like so yesterday well. someone asked me about eating garlic. There's a rule about not eating garlic, and they said, well, how did that come about and why? And actually the rule is something like based on um, a nun who apparently went into a farmer's field or something and took too much garlic and then got into trouble for that because she hoarded so much of it. Well, I mean, nowadays that's very unlikely to happen. And yet still in some traditions they say garlic's not really conducive to practice because it's a stimulant, you know, so people don't eat it. But in most of the Theravada world they do eat it. So you have to kind of see where it's coming from and... and learn to trust your wisdom and compassion and intuition on these things as well without actually breaking it but understanding the spirit of the rule sure. yeah i think that's the higher training with the vinaya because anyone can follow a law but to understand how it's helping you and in which context something feels appropriate is a lot more like taking responsibility for your own ethical development gotcha and as you say that this this is how it becomes a a training aid rather yes. than just yes. a rule and something yeah, exactly you butt up that. against. Yeah, exactly yeah, that. Nicely yeah. put. Yeah. Okay. I just just continuing with this idea that the bhikkhuni ordination, I think we mentioned earlier, but it'd be quite nice to contextualise it. That yeah, it's 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 pretty big what you're doing. It's not just some <laughs> nuns getting some extra rules. I mean, it's yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, 
it's very culturally <coughs> embedded. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the bigger picture in terms of culture and Asia and how mm. Theravada is quite patriarchal, you know. Yeah, I think yeah. many would say that. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it is still a, a patriarchal tradition, certainly. And yet in the Buddha's day, he was ordaining women, which was very progressive for those times, you know. And there was some sort of uh, resistance to that, I think, which is why he hesitated initially to ordain women. But even around that, there were stories and different interpretations of his so-called hesitation, you know, and some people feel that's been added later, because in another sutta, the Buddha said that he will not pass away and attain final liberation until the fourfold Sangha is established. That meant the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis, that's the fully ordained monks and the fully ordained nuns, and the laymen and the laywomen are established in the Dhamma. And that meant we have enlightened people in each of those groups. So his aim from the outset was to establish that fourfold community uh, very strongly so that it would be able to go into society and be an inspiration, you know, because sometimes women relate more to other women, men relate more to other men, sometimes. Sometimes it's the opposite. A man might feel more comfortable speaking to a bikuni about certain things, you know, and vice versa. Um, so, so I think, you know, the Buddha was always one step ahead of the, his times, but what tends to happen with any religion or institution is that things get a little bit fossilized, or what's the other word? Oss, oss, ossified? Ossified. Yeah. Ossified, yeah. yeah. Good word, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they don't move with the times. And so now, even though this seems progressive in the light of a quite traditional conservative um, religious movement, it's actually not. It's just trying to get up to the standard of ordinary society where men and women are more or less equal. I mean, there are still inequalities. But I never noticed those in my life very much until I came into the Thai forest Sangha, actually. Yeah. And that's when it really hit me that there's a huge difference and there's implications in terms of the training, the education, in terms of how easy it is to access teachings um, and just opportunities for living in communities that are conducive. It's far, far less. And so many women disrobed simply because there aren't suitable places to practice and that's really tragic because a lot of these people have very deep um, callings you know and have been practicing meditation for years and years and years and developing that aspiration so that's really sad um, so I think it's a natural movement really you know when something's imbalanced there has to be a kind of time that that imbalance becomes so kind of destructive and the tension there is so strong that something has to shift and hopefully that's what's happening. Um, I just don't think you can stop such a strong calling as that to ordain. You know, it's something that comes from the heart, it's very deep. You can't intellectualise it and say to people, well, yeah, you know, you can get enlightened as a temporary set non, you can get enlightened as a laywoman, just live a simple life. And often it, it's the monks saying these things, monks who themselves have found, have seen the value in monastic life. So, you know, why should women be limited by monks or men's idea of what we need or don't need? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I think it's probably a movement that's happening worldwide. You know, there's the Me Too movement going on, kind of highlighting abuses to women. Mm -hmm. And um, we're sort of saying we've had enough of all this. You know, we need the respect that's accorded to other people too. Um, and to get men also to do some other work and look at their internalised patriarchal attitudes and misogynistic attitudes. And women have got that too, you know, women have internalised that patriarchal, internalised patriarchy, you know. So we need to learn to empower each other and to build each other up rather than sort of, yeah, being in competition or be afraid, being afraid of other people who may seem stronger or more confident. Um, yeah, because I think we've really taken on those ideas. You know, for me, stepping into this kind of role as a leader and, and starting to teach was really quite scary. But my teacher told me, you know, you're just lacking the confidence. It's all in there. You just need the confidence. Mm. And so bit by bit, I'm starting to see that. And it becomes uh, less relevant anyway when you realise that you're benefiting people. <coughs> it's not about whether I feel ready or not. It's about can even one person just gain a little bit of peace or get a little bit of a tip about how to live more harmoniously, more kindly with themselves, you know. So uh, I think, yeah, we need to start stepping up. I, th I think as well something that's, I think why it's important to a lot of what you're doing is, 
I, I've certainly found a lot, like you mentioned, about sort of the boot camp idea. A lot of the practices tend to be very kind of hardcore and macho and mm -hmm. go a bit harder and sleep yeah. less and make more effort. And I got really caught up in that, made, you know, effort and effort and effort and effort. And, effort. Yeah. and then one day I just thought, I'm just not going to do this anymore. Yeah. And there really yeah. is a need for sort of a more a more feminine spirit yeah, if you like yeah. it's very valid that very mm -hmm, hardcore mm -hmm. practice but it mm -hmm. it needs to be balanced with something that's a bit softer and a bit more nurturing to right, my mind right, I, yeah. I, I got caught up very heavily in that yeah, for years yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. think now looking back go yeah could have just been okay. a bit softer on myself yeah, and I think we all yeah, could have been a bit yeah. softer on ourselves yeah, and yeah. got the same results and that right. It strikes me that what you're doing with this is, is over the long term introducing exactly that much needed spirit. Yes, yeah, could be, be a bit less testosterone laden, yeah, if you like. Be, I think be, yeah. so. Yeah, there is one retreat it. that happens at Guy House every year, which is led by a monk, and it's really interesting because his attitude is kind of the gung ho one. And there are many more men on that retreat than on any other retreat, Good so that's quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's such a clear dichotomy between the male and female approach because I used to do very disciplined practice, and I loved all that. I was young, I was like enthusiastic, and it's like let's just go for it, you know, and that worked for me to to a point. Um, but I think it, when you look at the Buddha's teachings and you read them carefully, there, there isn't that much emphasis on force or will at all. In fact, the Buddha talks about compassion as the motive for practice and compassion as the right intention all the way through the practice. And, you know, he emphasizes the Brahma Viharas of, you know, loving kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity again and again and again through the practices. And there's this really lovely sutta in, uh, I think it's the Anguttara called Upanissa Sutta, and it talks about the practice as a causal process, right? And the causal process actually begins with suffering, but it also can begin with virtue or ethics. And these two can lead to confidence in the teachings. And from that confidence, it says one does not need to make a volition, may joy arise, because it's natural that one with confidence in the Dhamma, joy starts to arise. And then using joy as a basis, it goes through this whole sequence of the meditation developing, which is natural, from joy into piti, into rapture, into tranquility, then happiness, and then the stillness of the mind, taking people into the deep stages of samadhi. So this is a really important sutta, and I think sometimes maybe because we are coming to Buddhism in a patriarchal context, certain suttas are overlooked and other ones are grasped at, you know. So the Satipatthana is very... Um, you know, heightened and made much of by many meditation groups. But there's nothing in the suttas to say that that one is more important than any other. There's no hierarchy of important teachings. And there are suttas like the Upanissa Sutta, which are, you know, basically pointing out an, the opposite of dependent origination. So they call it transcendental dependent origination or even dependent liberation. So not only the causes of suffering, but the causes for freedom from suffering. And the Buddha's saying that this is a process that happens naturally when the causes are in place, right? So actually it's showing that we don't need to be such agents and such kind of forces of will in our own practice. If we put all the causes in place and we develop this joy and kindness and softness in our approach, the process starts to happen on its own. So I think, yes, maybe you could say that's a feminine side, um, but it is very much a part of the Buddha's teachings too um, and yeah I think gentleness and being kind to ourselves is so needed I mean I emphasize that in every retreat I teach and people always say how helpful it is and I just don't think you can ever be too kind and too gentle you know no, I tend to agree. Can, can I can I ask? Yeah. What, uh, what, what is your practice? What, what do you do as a practice? Do you have a main um, I guess I started the practice through the Vipassana method which was very much involved in observing the body sensations and seeing the impermanent nature of those which, by no, which led into seeing the mind as impermanent too. Um, so you could say that uh, the focus on impermanence was like the main, the main object, looking at impermanence. Um, but then later on, I, I guess I got to the point in my meditation where I felt I'd seen that fairly thoroughly and yet I wasn't getting any deeper so it reached a sort of plateau and then I realized that I needed to get stiller I needed more depth in samadhi and in stillness to rest the mind 
So then I came in contact with Ajahn Brown's teachings and he emphasised what I've just been talking about, the kindness, the gentleness, the finding joy with every single moment, every single breath. And so then I started to really cultivate the wholesome states much more rather than simply the bare awareness focused on impermanence. So that was a very nice, a very equanimous kind of mind state. But I also saw the need to develop the beautiful qualities as well, to actively cultivate those. And so now um, I would say that my practice is much less um, directed, perhaps. It's much more about the attitude I bring to whatever I observe rather than exactly what I observe using a specific technique. It's a lot o more open. So when I sit down on my cushion, I'll usually ask my mind, like, how do you feel, mind? And then I'll listen in and tune up to what it wants. It's like, do you want to look at your body? Is there anything that hurts there? Let's have a look, you know. What's needed here to ease the pain? What's needed here to sort of relax the mind? Like what kind of attention can, can help me to calm and relax in a very gentle, natural way? And then if the breath wants to arise in my mind, I allow it to. But I don't go out and grab it and kind of try and make it stay. So it's a lot more gentle. It's more about putting the causes in place for the breath to want to come to me. Yeah? Just as I would you know, invite you here today and I put the chocolate out and I make you a cup of tea so that you want to come in. I wouldn't say, right, get in here, let's start the recording, you know, <laughs> sit down, stay there, you know, put some more clothes on or whatever. It's like, no, let's make the room warm, let's, you know, give you the chocolate and whatever else you need for the interview. And then you want to stay and we have a nice time hanging out. <laughs> so it's kind of that sort of approach, if that makes sense. So it's more looking at the relationship I have with my experience than trying to go after a particular type of experience and I find that's really helpful um, for the for getting myself a little bit out of the way so I'm not so much forcing things to happen but allowing them to without always interfering in the process I'm sort of trying to get a yeah it's a bit complex <laughs> no it's, uh, I'm sort of trying to get a picture of how that yeah. so you know let's say if you're doing a formal sitting uh -huh. you might sit and you just you just sort of check in with yourself, is that what First you're saying? First of all, yeah, yeah okay. and I establish uh, a wholesome attitude, a wholesome motivation. For example, rather than, okay, I'm going to sit here and what I want out of this meditation is to feel pe more peaceful at the end, it's more like I'm sitting here for the sake of sitting, I'm giving my time to the Buddha, I'm giving my time for the sake of kindness, gentleness, you know, developing beautiful qualities and then those thoughts uplift my mind and set me off on the right track. Oh, I really like that. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. And then th something you said right at the beginning of that thing, you said it's about, remind me something like the attitude you bring to what comes up or the relationship yeah, or something. Yeah, the relationship could, could you, with the experience. Yeah, could you yeah. say a bit more so about So I think that? in life we're usually arguing with experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we have one kind and we say, I don't really want that kind of experience, I want yeah. something different. Oh, that one. <laughs> yeah, and where's the problem there? Is the problem with the experience or is the problem with you not wanting the experience? You know, the Buddha said that it's this wanting or not wanting that is the cause of suffering. It's not experience itself so much as our attitude toward it mm -hmm. so of course at a deeper level experience itself can be seen to be empty and suffering and impermanent but at a you know before we're at that point in our practice we can reduce a lot of suffering by purifying our relationship to what we experience yeah so it's about becoming more content in the moment with whatever arises because the buddha said suffering has to be understood and if we're constantly fighting against it and wanting to see something different, something other than what's arising, how are we ever going to see? How are we ever going to understand the nature of what's arising? And so we need to find ways to sort of uh, be able to stay with what's arising. And one of the best ways is to develop kindness towards it. So that even the most difficult sensation or thought or emotion can be held in that kindness long enough for it to open up and reveal its nature. How, how would kindness look? How would it look? I mean, one it, of the ways I try to, to um, evoke that in the meditation is to ask each person what kindness means to them and perhaps using um, imagination or visualisation, imagine somebody who's very kind, you know, who you think of as very kind, say a Buddha or, you know, and imagine how the Buddha would regard you. Like, would the Buddha look at you in a judgmental way, in a way of, you know, 
kind of harshness or yeah or would he look at you in a kind way understanding that you're a product of your conditioning and you just need kindness so I kind of evoke that in my mind and imagine that I'm sitting there either with my teacher or with the Buddha or with kind friends or just remember a moment of kindness either that was shown to me or that I showed to someone else and contact that feeling and then bring that same warmth and gentleness and kindness it's a, to my awareness yeah so one way that you could describe it as well is using your awareness as a kind of medium through which to channel that warmth yeah so your your mind makes contact with a sensation you've got that contact so now's your chance to give it warmth give it kindness yeah. and and you, you you would do this sort of on an ad hoc basis as it were or there's something particularly difficult I'll generate this or this you is part of your careful. intention at the beginning that yeah. you, you start it so it goes right yeah. the way through I think it's it? more like starting at the beginning because yeah. you have to be really careful with the mind it's so tricky that if you sort of use kindness because I've got a difficult sensation and by using kindness I can relax it and get rid of it that's not real kindness so it's really a very open attitude of you know may may my, the door of my heart be open to whatever arises and may I meet it kindly and learn to hold it gently. And then just trying to get in touch with that sort of mood, if you like, of the mind. And after a while you notice when you've lost it. You know, I notice that my mind's contracting around something difficult. But because I remember how it is to look, regard things warmly, I can bring that imagery to mind. Or I can remember like, okay, so this sensation is just like a, a, a friend who's hurting. How would I regard them? I'd give them warmth. I'd say, oh, how are you? I'm sorry you feel that way. Rather than, eh, I don't want this, you know. I wanted you to talk about something nice or I wanted you to give me a certain feeling or experience. That's not kindness. Mm -hmm. So after a while you get used to the feel of it and you start to notice when you've lost that right attitude and you've started sort of, yeah, pulling away or, or clinging, you know, leaning into and trying to grasp onto things. It feels tight in the mind. Yeah. And, and with this, I know you've mentioned a few times the Brahma Viharas, would mm. this be a way of practicing the Brahma Viharas or is it just yeah. part of the standard? I always think of metta practice as twofold. I mean, this is my own little um, just way of conceptualizing it. One could be the active cultivation of metta as an object of samadhi, so a way to develop the stillness. The People use the word concentration, but I like to think of it as like stillness and sustained attention with an object. So, you know, that would be repeating the words of metta and continuously building that metta, cultivating that metta in the heart. But another way of practicing is to use metta as an attitude to any experience. So that's not actually trying to cultivate a feeling of loving-kindness, that's just using loving-kindness as a way to respond to any feeling. Yeah. So that contains both the pleasant and the unpleasant. So yeah, I think that you can do both, I think it's good to do both, because if you practice metta as a cultivation over periods of time, then you're more likely to tune in to that when you need it as an attitude. Yeah. And do you, do you, if you don't mind my asking details, do, do you do you have a, a samadhi practice and a, a broader practice, or do they intermingle? As I said, or do, with, not in the really. process, do you start like that? Yeah, like I tend to sit down and see what my mind's in the mood for, right? But because I've got different tools in the toolbox, so to speak, from Vipassana and from doing metta practice and anapana practice, I can sort of generally incline to one or the other depending on what's needed. Sometimes it's intuitive, it's not a conscious decision. Um, but I think the main kind of yardstick is whatever helps to undermine the hindrances, right? Whatever helps to undermine the unwholesome states and develop the wholesome states, that's going to be a good one for your practice. Yeah. Sometimes the mind's really not in the mood to become still. It's more investigative, it's more dynamic. Or maybe there's more distraction, there's more thinking. And then I find it really helpful to go to the body and just do a bit of exploration mm, about what's happening there, right. and you know just ground myself and also get involved with the sensations because my mind feels quite dynamic other time my mind just needs a rest so then I try to bring up these feelings of kindness and stillness and just let go so different things other times if there's aversion or irritation in the mind you feel like you need a bit more meta it's like TLC to the body and mind like sort of stroking yeah 
No, partly I was asking because you mentioned you know you, you did Vipassana for a long time mm-hmm. with the Goenka and then you found Ajahn Brahm right. and it was all about samadhi yeah, and I wondered yeah. you know did you start a formal samadhi practice or I don't really know how that I think I did works. shift over more to that because I felt that I'd taken Vipassana as deeply as I could without pe- deep practice of jhanas um, so yeah I think I did and also because it took quite a long time to recondition my mind to see the breath just as breath I started seeing everything just as dissolving sensations. <laughs> so I had to make this massive kind of perception shift. And that took some time. And also I was getting benefits that sort of, uh, that I didn't expect to, because as I said earlier, I feel that the way Ajahn Brahm approaches Samadhi practice is very good for the understanding of non-self. Because it's really about getting out of the way and seeing where we're interfering and driving the process. So it started to produce different kinds of insights, as well as stilling the mind. And also bring a lot of joy and happiness, which I think was there with the Vipassana, definitely, because I love to meditate and I would sit for long hours and be really very absorbed, very calm. But uh, I never actively cultivated quite intense happiness. I didn't really realise that that was part of the path actually actively generating it rather than just equanimity yeah uh yeah yeah and i think that comes with rather than the so-called bare awareness where we just allow experience to come to our mind and we just observe actually observing with the kindness so ajahn brahm calls that kindfulness as opposed to mindfulness and it makes a difference there is more pleasure there's a more emotional warmth in that um but it does happen, you know, it, it, it is a natural process. It's just you set yourself off on the right foot and then the happiness tends to build. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's, it's more proactive. A little bit. It's more just about noticing the happiness that's there because sometimes we can, you know, just overlook it. Yeah, it's just another thing We think, to oh yeah, I'm quite it? peaceful, so what, you know. Mm. But there was one instruction that he gave during one of the rains retreats which was just notice bliss. And one of my meditations, I thought, yeah, I should just notice, like, okay, there's nothing much there, but let me have a little bit of a closer look. And I just looked a bit more closely behind what was perhaps a coarser feeling to something more mental. It's very hard to describe these things, but it felt like a much more subtle mental kind of happiness. And as soon as I noticed it, it just became absolutely predominant. It became the main object and it just literally blew up in my mind and became extremely intense. And that was really interesting, because I noticed that it was there all along, I just didn't kind of value it enough. Because the flavour is also very different from the flavour of sensual happiness. It's not dependent on any of the senses, and you know, or sight, sounds, touches, smells. So it's you're, a mental you're, thing. You're saying it's there anyway, it's just... I think it often is there, yeah. The thing is, we're never content with our experience, so we don't stay there long enough for it to open up. And then it makes you see also that, you know, perhaps there is no intrinsic value in any experience. It's more the way you relate which makes it pleasant or unpleasant. Right? I mean, if you're content with pain, it actually starts to change. And it stops being so painful. What you're saying about the bliss being there, it reminds me of that phrase, you know, people always say about enlightenment. It's just dust in your eyes and you're uncovering the yeah, dust and you're kind of yeah, saying yeah, yeah. you're wiping away a bit of the dust and look yeah. there's that yeah, yeah, bliss yeah. that was there anyway just right. it felt like that away, in yeah. this experience it felt like curtains were moving back and I was like yeah it was really mm-hmm. interesting mm-hmm. It felt like that I understood why the Buddha talks about the hindrances as curtains or obscurations is another word but curtains and mm-hmm. uh, veils or curtains yeah yeah it's a subtle kind of aversion when we're not content with our practice we're not content in this moment yeah I I I think often people as well they get this when you start with a practice when when nice things do start happening joy and bliss and that you get this I'm I'm supposed to not cling on to this I'm supposed to let go of this and and I noticed I did it for a long time I'd I'd push it away very quickly and and there's noticing this aversion towards Uh it and I'm uh like hold on yes this is really nice this is joy why am I doing this stop that let it go yeah 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 and this is again where insight can arise because we're Mm. actually not accustomed to it and it goes Mm. against our sense of self often our sense of self is bound up with suffering 
It's like I'm the person that feels this mood, that mood, this kind of suffering, you know. That's who I am. That's who I have to be. There's and a the slight happiness, guilt, isn't there? You know, yeah, there's a guilt. You're supposed absolutely. to be working. You're not supposed to be enjoying yeah, your meditation. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Where that comes from, who knows? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the way it's taught sometimes, you know, be careful, you'll get attached. Mm, but the Buddha mm. never said that, actually. He actually said that the four outcomes of being so-called attached or addicted to happiness in meditation are the four stages of enlightenment. <laughs> Can you say that again? Yeah, the, the four outcomes, the only outcomes, the only dangers, if you like, not dangers, mm. of um, getting addicted or making much of bliss or the four stages of enlightenment. I used to wonder when I was practicing Vipassana, why does he talk about jhanas, 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 jhanas everywhere in the texts? I mean, why? These are bliss states. So they're obviously a part of the practice. And the Eightfold Path ends with Samadhi. So it's, it's part of it. It's, part of, it's a natural result of mm. purifying the mind. Yeah, because there was, there was one there's something about what are we addicted to because we're addicted to jhanas, aren't we? And that's a, okay. a wholesome addiction, I think. Yeah, it's great. I mean, ultimately, you do have to see that those states too are like volitionally produced. And well, it says that in the suttas, it uses the word volitionally produced, conditioned and therefore subject to, to uh, disappearing. But that's part of the insight too. <laughs> Can, can I just get a little, just sort of go back over your timeline, as it were? So, you you went to Asia quite early on in life, and and ended up in India at the Goenka Centres. Is that right? Pretty much. Yeah. Was that sort of yeah. your first encounter with? Yeah, there with was another retreat I did right before the Goenka practice, but it was with two um, Western teachers who'd been on his retreats and been on various other retreats and put together their own kind of uh, retreat format. But it was very much based on on Goenkaji's teachings. Yeah. And so, so, how long did you stay out in India doing that? Uh, from about well, so I went to India in ninety four. I was in India most of of the time until about two thousand and two, and then I came back to England and did a degree in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, only because do. I hadn't found a monastery, and my mom suddenly said, "There's this degree going on. You know, you'll be able to get a loan because you haven't done a degree yet." And I thought, well, I'm 27, maybe I should just do it because I can't find a monastery. And then if I don't find somewhere to ordain, at least I have something that I consider like meaningful and wholesome in terms of the world. But of course, I hadn't given up my search at all. And every summer I'd go back to Asia and uh, practice for the three months. So I'd go to India and do my long retreats. And then the second year, I heard about my teacher in Burma and I knew I have to go and ordain. So I ordained in the holidays after my second year. So did you start doing this at my math 19? Mm-hmm. So you really quite young and really went for it. So yeah. very, something very strong in you. Yes. And so can, can I ask a bit about your teacher in Burma? How, how, yeah. what, was the, what did you hear that was so urgent for you? Well, I heard that he was, uh, I guess he was in the same sort of tradition, but he'd um, gone quite deep, let's say, in his meditation, because you can't talk about these things in so many words, but, you know. I knew that something had happened there and that he was, um, he'd been offered some land from some of his supporters who uh, had confidence in him to create a monastery and he wanted to welcome Westerners as well as Burmese, even though he didn't speak English, but he um, wanted to make a place of practice for people, which would be a meditation place. And I just knew this is, this is it, this is it, because I'd been in Burma many times and I always had a sense I'd ordain there. Um, and I was just overwhelmed with delight to hear it. I was in a bus actually in India, going between one village and another in Gujarat after a, a long course with Goenka. And uh, I was just, I was just like so hysterical about it. I was like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. This is amazing. I've got to go there next year. And uh, yeah, so I did. And how, and how long did you stay there? <laughs> so that year I ordained for the three months of my holidays. And he said to me, just stay. But I felt like I owed it to my mum to go back because she was helping me a little bit with my rent in London. So I felt like I needed to complete what I'd started with the degree. But I made the commitment that I'd go back as soon as I could. So, yeah, took a year of the degree and then another sort of eight months or so to do part of my internship and just kind of tie up all the loose ends 
So I went back to Asia and did some more serving and did some more long retreats and then got back to Burma in 2006. And how long did you stay there for? Well, that was the thing. I always used to say, I'm never leaving, I'm never leaving to anyone who asked, but I got really sick and uh, tried to stay despite the sickness, but in the end I needed to to go because the lifestyle, the climate in particular and the food was contributing to the sickness and just, it was worsening. So, but around the same time that that happened, I also contacted Ajahn Brahm's teachings um, that he gives to the monks, and they were from sort of the 90s, late 90s, and they just blew my mind. They were very different from the ones you hear on YouTube nowadays, a lot more focused and sort of on particular topics, and every single talk he gave was like the best exposition I'd ever heard on any given subject that I listened to. I just got goosebumps, you know, the PT would arise, and a lot of... um, just a sense of strong connection with him as a teacher, like, I've got to meet this teacher. And this is where I'm at in my practice, and it's the next step for me. So it just, so, it just came at the right time. And the it right... really did, yeah. yeah. It was quite overwhelming. So I do my like really long day of meditation, 14 or 16 hours, and uh, I'd get back to my kuti, and it would be the only time I'd have to play a talk, so I'd just stay up an extra hour just to listen. And I guess also, because it was all in English, it just kind of seeped in. It was so beautiful. I could just absorb it all. Whereas with the Burmese, I had to really listen and try to pick it up and keep could, could you speak track. To Burmese? I learned to tune up to my teacher's instructions to the extent that I could understand them completely. But the Dhamma talks, I could only ever understand about 50 or 60 percent. Yeah, because there wasn't really any, uh, there weren't textbooks or Burmese teachers for us there. So we had to rely on little tape recorders and transcribing you know, his uh, talks and then trying to get various sounds that are scribbled down, translated. So, yeah. So, were, were you, so when you were in the, the monastery in Burma, were, were you mostly practising? Were you mostly mm. a practice monastery yeah, yeah, for four absolutely. years? So just really... Four in the morning till nine at night. For how long? Or longer. <laughs> for how long? Uh, well, it was across four years, but because of my health problems, I had to keep leaving and I'd go to Bangkok and try and sort of have tests done and stuff and nothing very conclusive came. Or something would come around and they'd give me treatment, but it hadn't solved the problem. So I kept returning after a couple of months and trying again, but it just wasn't working, you health-wise. Did, you were still doing some pretty serious practice oh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. same time. Absolutely, wow, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. But with this this failing health as well. Yeah, and the thing is with that sort of practice that you're quite cool about that because the body's the body and you're equanimous with the sensations and it doesn't matter, you sit there, you feel really peaceful. But at the end of the day, I'd just be in quite a lot of um, pain and you know, a lot of belching, Do- all kinds digest- of bacteria. Digestive problems. Mostly yeah, I mean, that's another story, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people get sick when they live in Burma for a long time or even a short time. And, and so from there, so you had four, so you've got eight years in India, then you've got four years in Burma, and then you, you hear about Ajahn Brahm, right. and then you, you get to go to Perth, is that right? Yeah, a couple of years later only. A couple of years, so what, yeah. you came back here or something? I came back to Europe, and I had friends who could help me in terms of, like, giving me somewhere to stay and be on personal retreat, and also I stayed in Amavati and Chithurst monasteries for quite a long time, actually, probably a total of about a year, so I joined a rains retreat, I joined a winter's retreat. Um, at separate times and some month long stays as well Um, and then finally in 2012 I got the chance to go to Perth but in the meantime I'd met Adrian Brown a couple of times and he knew that you know I'd left Burma to try to get over there and he sort of had me under the wing I think yeah Right, so, and, and then to 2012 you were over there, yeah. and, and I think your de- full ordination was 2014, so a couple of years yeah, later. Yeah, was, okay, yeah. yeah, so I had to find a space for them to take me in the mm-hmm. monastery, because again, because there were so few nuns monasteries, there were wait lists, and there aren't many spaces, so it took a while to really mm-hmm. land. So, so how, how, when did he give you your mission to... Come over uh, here that was, that well, it was only a joke at first, or at least I thought it was a joke. Because I just said, what about I go to England? He sort of said, yeah, that's what you should do. If I'm your teacher, I say that's what you should do. And he never says that because he doesn't control anyone or tell them what to do. So I just thought, oh, ha, ha, you know, that's funny, sort of. Maybe maybe it's a good idea. I'll, I'll see about that later. So then I checked in with him again in the end of 2015 before a journey back to England, just a holiday. I had my return ticket. And I said, you know, when we talked about that, were you actually serious? And he sort of said, oh, yeah, well, you know, just see if there's any interest. And if there is, then 
see what happens and if not come back so I just thought oh yeah whatever I'll just go and see but even while we were talking about it there was some kind of sparks I don't know you know when you think you've got onto something that sounds a bit way up there like how on earth would you ever do such a thing there was some kind of real inspiration in it and it was a sense that now I could really be kind of having that close guidance from him also that I really wanted and it was also a way to repay my gratitude to him because he's English and he wants to see something happen here so I kind of felt honoured and also it's an opportunity right so when I came back I sort of made a couple of inquiries with the only English people I knew that were his disciples and they were just so overwhelmed with like eagerness um, that I mentioned it to him, to Ajahn Brown. And I said, but you know, obviously nothing can happen unless you get involved and come over to England, which I thought was highly unlikely. And he just really amazed me by saying, yeah, sure, I'll come. I'm like, huh? And he's like, yeah, I'll come like in a few months and do some teaching. So suddenly I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to organise it and sort of figure out how to put things together. What do I need to do? Because I have no experience in any of this. I've been in the meditation centres and in the forest most of my life, right? Most of my adult life. And so the first thing was I thought, well, we'll need a bank account, right? Because if we're going to like hire venues, we're going to have to like have tickets, we're going to need a bank account. So how do you get a bank account? Oh, you need to have a trust. How do you get a trust? Oh, so it needs to be a charitable trust. <laughs> and just bit by bit, I started to sort of meet people and put this idea out. And uh, people started to be interested. And uh, I kind of didn't have much choice at that point because he said he was coming. So I talked to my abbot in the nuns monastery and she just said, well, I don't see how you can be over in Perth and organise the tour. So I said, oh, OK. But I'm not leaving the monastery or anything. She said, no, no, that's fine. You know, of course you're not. You're still part of the community, but just see how it goes. And I guess, yeah, I went back there for the rains retreat, as usual. And Ajahn Brahm came back over to England to teach. And it went really well, and it was very inspiring. And uh, at the end of that retreat, we got a big donation. And I guess that was when I realised, uh-oh, it's looking serious, you know. And Ajahn Brahm wrote me this email and said, sit down before you read this. So I sat down, and it's like... Somebody donated, like, quite a few hundred thousand. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I can't just, like, not give it everything I've got at this point. And, and so, so now, now the plan, as I understand it, is you want to set up a training monastery for bhikkhunis, female nuns in yeah, England. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And so you, you've more or less got the funds in place. Not entirely, because things cost a lot over here, so I think we need to continue raising funds, and we invite donations, mm. so that's very much needed, because even being in Oxford at the moment, it's just a small house with four rooms, four bedrooms, so one of them is my study, so we have room for two guests. We can do three at a push, but the rent's like 2000 a month, you know, because I need to be somewhere accessible enough for people to come and feed me. You know, again, we don't handle money, we don't cook for ourselves as fully ordained bikinis, so this has its limitations. So until, you know, there are enough supporters to see that those basic needs are met, we can't really move further afield. And I think I also need somebody with me more full time, so either an aspirant who may want to train or just a long term lay steward to handle the money and the cooking and some of the admin as well to relieve my load. So because of the way it started, you know, with me being asked to just see how things, see how the land lay, so to speak, over here, I was alone for the first, well, I'm still alone with the project. Normally you'd have a group of people who came out, but there was nothing to come to. So this is, you know, we're sort of minus the, the period where we've got a community together. So it's almost like the ground where it's being done so before really the stage are, where yeah. most people start a monastery. Yeah. Do you have a? Can you see? Do you have a rough time scale? How long it might? How far away? I really are you? don't know. I mean, at first, from the beginning, we thought two or three years, but now it is actually the fourth year. So, <laughs> I mean, this fourth year has been the pivotal point, really, in the sense that we have had a base, and I get a sense of how it's going to feel to live in England, because that's a big thing anyway for me, like psychologically, to come back to my own country which I left at the yeah, age of 19. It, how's it been? It's, it's been really good, actually. Busy, yeah. It's been really yeah. nice and quite encouraging to see that I can be content in a little house in Oxford, even though I'm used to being in the forest. It doesn't matter, you know, you have your practice with you wherever you are. And there's lots of beautiful nature nearby. 
Um, but I think the main thing, and this is what I've always said to Adrian Bram, is not the size of the building or, you know, how many people I can accommodate. It's the people who come in. It's the relationships we have together and the kindness and the, the inspiration that we share. And so that's what makes the monastery. And I think so far, even though it's little, we've had an awful lot of that, you know, so much kindness, so many happy memories already, and a sense that there's a really wholesome beginning, you know. A lot of oh, potential wonderful. spiritual friends and a spiritual community building up. So for me, that is the monastery. And the bigger it gets, the bigger the accommodation will have to be to accommodate it. And will you stay so, in the city? Will you go to the... I mean, in the long run, I definitely want to be in the forest. Mm. You know, so-called forest. Forest in the Buddha's day didn't really mean thick trees necessarily. It just meant in the sort of rural areas, away from a lot of busyness. But this is quite quiet here, so... Yeah, we'll just see. It's not really under my control. And I think that's one of the things I really want to convey to anybody who's interested in this, that it is a community effort, you know, and it takes a team to achieve the aims we have. So it's very much open, and, you know, if there's a group of very strong supporters in a particular place, and they say, you know, we'll do what's necessary to look for a property and to see that you're supported, then, yeah, I'll give it a go, you know, I'll incline over there. So it's really feeling things out for now. And I'd actually like to try a few different areas temporarily before we decide on any particular place for the long term. Because, you know, as you said in the beginning, this is something that's very new. You know, in the context of the Buddha's teachings, I mean, the Bhikkhuni Sangha was supposedly died out after about a thousand years. And it's only just getting established again, you know. So it's going to take time. And that doesn't matter. I mean, even if I die and there's only me, but there's facilities to support bikinis in the future, that is already a big step. It's huge, isn't it? You know, if there are two or three of us, that's fantastic, because that's already almost a full sangha. When you've got four, you can start having your sangha meetings and making decisions, and yeah. And soon enough, you know, many of the bikinis are going to be 12 years in the robes and able to ordain other nuns. So at that point, things are going to start to move more quickly. It'll gather momentum, won't it? Yeah, it will. Yeah. It's just the early days that are tricky. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. there aren't any spare bikinis floating around that can come and help me out, you know. I love the <laughs> idea of a spare bikini. Yeah, quite, oh. whereas, you know, any monks' monasteries, they just have a permanent influx of people that want to come over from Burma or Thailand or wherever. I mean, there's any number, hundreds, thousands that would love to come. Oh, really? Okay. So, yeah. 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 Just a, a couple of, couple of other points, just... As a couple of people said one of the things they'd like to hear about in a podcast is what does a monk or nun's day consist of? Day. You know, how does it's it as varied as what does a lay person's day consist it, of yeah. in a way, but I guess the um, kind of obvious container is the meditation. So ideally I would begin the me- day with the meditation, depending on how late what, I've been what working. What time does your day start? Uh, usually I wake up at about 5, 5.30, but I don't make myself wake up. That's more the sunshine that wakes me up. <laughs> and then I will meditate or else I'll continue to rest if I'm tired. Um, and usually I just do that alone. Um, sometimes I come down and sit, it depends. Um, but I don't have a very fixed schedule here because I want it to be relaxed. You know, that's the way my teachers taught me to, to just relax and listen to what your body and mind needs at that time. And then the morning will usually consist of a shared breakfast and a little work meeting just to, you know, discuss any duties that need to be done for the day. We normally have a a little Dhamma reflection after breakfast, normally a reading either from the suttas or from one of the books that inspires me, usually one of Ajahn Brahm's books. Um... And then at lunchtime, the food is offered by whoever's staying with me. So at the moment, Tao Kalea is offering the food, and she's a very good cook, and it has a lot of love embedded in those flavours. One of the main flavours is the love. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then, uh, Sounds like nice food. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice food. It always tastes better, you know, in this kind of context. And especially when you don't know what's coming and you haven't asked for it, it's a gift. It's just a blessing to be fed. So we eat the food and I give a little dumb reflection, usually anything that comes to mind. So that's nice because sometimes nothing comes to mind, but I just open my mouth and something comes out. So that's a good training. <laughs> and then uh, normally afternoons are quiet. I mean, the last month's been fairly busy with a lot of different guests and visitors. And also we were looking for property just to see if we were ready to buy something. It didn't turn out to be the case that we were ready, but it was uh, an interesting process. But ordinarily, the afternoons will be silent periods for us to meditate independently. 
the Dummer Hall is always available, which is just a little lounge next door. Uh, and then in the evening we would get together and uh, meditate again and maybe have a Dhamma talk or a Sutta discussion based on the Buddha's teachings. Um, and then every Friday and Saturday we open that up to the public, so anyone who wants to contact us is welcome to come over and uh, share the talk or the discussion together. Yeah. And then on top of that I have uh, teaching engagements outside, so if people invite me I can be available to various Buddhist groups. Um, what else can be involved? I mean, for me in the mornings, it's a lot of admin, you know, project management stuff, which I have no experience with, so it's a bit random, you know, as to what gets done. Um, and then organising the events for Ajahn Brown, because he comes every year now to teach and lead retreats. So that's there's a lot involved, actually, even in a nine-day schedule. I can um, imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah, imagine. So. Yeah. And, and something we mentioned earlier, you know, you... you after all these years of practice and mm-hmm. being a monastic, how, what what's what does all this practice do for you? What are the <laughs> how does it make you feel? Yeah, I suppose for me it's easier to answer that in terms of like how you feel when you first come into contact with the Dhamma, because once it becomes part of your life, it's just normal to live in the Dhamma, you know, and to make those values of developing kindness and compassion the kind of most important thing in your life. So I suppose uh, the long-term effects of that are you have a lot more confidence in your own ethical integrity. You know, living a virtuous life becomes quite natural and it gives you a lot of joy. But in the beginning, I think, it was the relief of having found a path, you know, and just the, the joy that came from that, that there is this framework, there's a meaning to suffering, you know, there's a cause to suffering. And by removing that cause, we can find a happiness that's beyond, you know, the ups and downs in life. So that remains very much a a kind of reality for me, and it's incredibly inspiring. I mean, it depends on, you know, how inspired I feel at any given time, I suppose, as to how prevalent that is in my my day. Um, But I think one thing I'm very blessed with is just having a very clear sense of purpose and meaning in my life. And that, of course, contributes a lot to happiness. Even psychological research has shown that that is a higher sort of predictor of a person's uh, quality of life and happiness than hedonic happiness, which is based on pleasure or, you know, positive mood. So that gets me through a lot of ups and downs, you know, because like any human being, you have your bad days, you have your good days, you know, you have the things that trigger you. You know, there's a lot happening in the world that could trigger me (laughs) at the moment, but um, I feel like I can do something to contribute to the good in the world, and that is an enormous relief. So I can focus on that, you know, and um, try to bring just a safe space for other people to come and experience the goodness of the human heart and experience their own goodness, because we sometimes don't notice that. So, yeah, it's looking at those values and making those the most important thing. And I I think partly what I'm asking is for people who have little experience of this, Mm. and and I've I mentioned before I bought quite heavily into this you know there's there's an idea that you know you do all this practice you'll never experience a negative emotion mm. or your problems go away or you'll live yeah. on a cloud for the rest of your right, days yeah, and right. you, you, could, you get the keys to Shangri-La somehow right, or yeah, something what yeah. if you could just just yeah, address yeah, that yeah. a little bit but. it's really interesting I mean some people may feel that monastic life or meditation in general is an escape but it's actually the precise opposite it brings you into contact with what's happening in your body and mind and I think that is the really fascinating part because as soon as you see what's happening, you have a chance to like tweak it a bit, you know, and see the ways that you're responding and reacting in life and how that um, exacerbates the problem, you know. So it's not that you stop doing those things, but by bringing awareness to them, you definitely undermine the habit patterns. You make them open, first of all, and then you learn to kind of um, relate to things in a healthier way. You know, and that includes when you do react and you do relate to things in an unhealthy way. You can even have compassion for that. You know, you can learn to forgive yourself for not being perfect. There's a, such a strong drive in the West and in probably most people to be perfect, and it's completely unrealistic. So I think the practice can be quite humbling. And I would also say that it's important as a practitioner who's serious about the Dhamma to serve and to you know give service on other retreats. You know, volunteer their time. Because that way you see that you're not so special, your mind's not so different from anyone else's, you know. Um, 
and everybody goes through struggles in the same way. We can also bring a lot of lightness and humour to it when we see that. You know, stop taking ourselves so seriously. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something don't we, we, we very much do, don't we? Absolutely, and it can just be another kind of ego, a spiritual yeah. ego, you know, yeah. the idealised version of myself. Yeah. But that's not what the Buddha taught. We don't have to improve or be anyone different. We just need to start to understand who we are and, um, and in a way, hone in on our strengths, you know, accept our weaknesses and, yeah, cultivate the strengths. I'm, I'm getting the sense from what you're saying that what's happening with the practice you know problems come and go negative states come and go but there's more mm -hmm. a sense of the way you relate to them feels much yeah very different and perhaps there's more ease and there's more health around that yeah. if that makes sense yeah and you're not so surprised by them yeah you're not so surprised you know you start to know your own mind it's like oh yeah i'm doing that again <laughs> so you see it more quickly and you can stop it too yeah yeah. You see how it's conditioned too, which I think is important. How do you mean? You see like, that you are basically a product of everything you've learned in life. You're a product of your society, of the way you were parented, of the people you're around, the influences you're around. A particular job you know, will either bring out the best or the worst in you. <laughs> so it's not really so much that you're in control of it, but you can modify those conditions to... Yeah. To give yourself optimum well-being. And you can choose to respond yeah. perhaps more appropriately to Right. Mm. And choose to have wise companions. Do, do, you, do you miss having the opportunity to, you know, you were able to do a lot of practice over the years. Yeah, and now do. from what you said, you're working pretty hard I on miss it, but I also have my three months in the summer, well, which is the Rains Retreat in Perth. So as long as that's in place, I feel like it's okay, right. because when I go there, I can see that I've not regressed. Sometimes I think, oh dear, you know, I'm losing all that meditation energy and momentum, because, of course, over all that time of practice, you do gain a lot of momentum, you know, to the point where you hardly think anymore, and, you know, you're just very, very aware, and the mind's bright, it's clear... You know, there's a lot of lucidity and there's a sense that, you know, the path is progressing um, because it is just cause and effect. You know, the more time you put in, the better, you know, the more quickly you move forward. Um, but when I do go to Perth and meditate, I see that, you know, what I've been doing hasn't been a waste of my time. It's been serving the Dhamma. And so I have been cultivating a lot of wholesome states and you know, a lot of self-sacrifice too. You know, it's not only about me and my progress, it's about what am I giving, what am I giving back? Because I've already been fortunate to have a lot of meditation time, you know, and although I would have loved to wait until further in my monastic life before starting a project like this, I have actually had a lot more time than a lot of nuns have, you know, because this is quite a new thing, so it's time to give something back. Have you found that having to engage in the world in this way, have you found it's helped the practice? I guess so, in certain ways. Um, I'm not sure it directly translates to helping the meditation practice, although there is a joy that arises from having been serving so much. I can see that I haven't um, had time to let the mind kind of go into too many useless thoughts or time wasting because there's just too much to engage myself with. So, in, And also there's a sense of confidence that's building up. Um, so certain certain qualities have improved, certain qualities have developed in me. Um, and in terms of the meditation practice, I would say that it hasn't gone backwards. It's probably it's hard to say. It's very hard to quantify practice, and I think it we have to be careful yeah. to do that. Sorry, it hasn't. You don't feel like it's regressed, no. though. No, no, I don't. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I don't. And I know you mentioned just a, a few minutes. You said, oh, you know, when you're really practicing hard, there was the the, the mental chatter really went mm. right mm. down. Does mm. that? Does that come back up now that you've... Had Does the mental chatter come back up? Not too much, actually. Because of the way I incline my mind towards the happiness of peace and the happiness of, like, just the time I do get to sit. You know, it's like I value it and so I make the most of it. It's like not the time mm -hmm. to waste with a lot of blah, blah, blah. And if it happens, you know, you develop that kindness towards it. Yeah. So it doesn't become too much of a problem. Yeah. I yeah. think I'm learning not to measure it so much. And what I can say is that on my long retreats, I really, really value the time. So I get really quite happy fairly quickly and, uh, and make the best use of those three months. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> um, would, would you envisage a time 
I know it's probably a long way off, but would you think at some point I'd, I'd love to go, you know, you'd love to go back to that way of mm, just having the time to put down? <laughs> renounce. <laughs> Sometimes I tell Ajibam, I'm thinking of re-renouncing. But, uh, but I think there's something to be said for being committed, you know, and seeing things through. Um, but definitely in the long run, I, I think I can do that and still be part of the community because I would love to give people who come and live with me the opportunity for long retreat in other places. You know, once we have a bigger community, we can rotate. It's not that everybody has to be here the whole time, you know, but the in-service is important. It's just about getting a good balance. At the moment, the balance is way over on the service side. Um, and so I'd like to eventually kind of, you know, redress that a little bit mm. and have more time on a daily level. But I think that will come in time. Because actually, and Charles' teaching seem yeah. to be very much about, you know, work, be mindful in your work and... Yes and service, no. I wonder how much that is uh, is exaggerated to some degree because, as I understand, they did get up early and practice from you know three a.m. in the morning, and they probably did have quite a lot of long sittings and overnight sittings and that kind of thing. But he right. definitely didn't try to separate that from uh, work. I think this is a dichotomy that's a very Western idea, you know, that work and practice is different, or service is somehow taken away from your meditation time. It's actually all the same thing. You know, it's an eightfold path, and sati and samadhi is only two of those factors. What about all the other factors? We need to be cultivating those too, and service is a really excellent way to do that. You can't develop right speech in silence. You can abstain from unwholesome speech, but you can't actually cultivate the wholesome. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. There's certain active practices of sila that we need to do. Just at the point, sort of winding up soon, but. You mentioned about Ajahn Brahma being this a horrible word, excommunicated, but you know, he's been sort of <laughs> yeah. cut away from the from the Thai Sangha. <laughs> how, how what's how, what's the effect of that? What's the it sounds like there's some, some anger going the effect, on? No, from Ajahn Brahma's side he's fine. Not I think from his was, side, but maybe from the Thai side. I don't know. I don't really want to speak for them because I don't no. know and I think that everybody will have their own ideas. Maybe they don't think about it very much, you know. I think from the perspective of the Perth monasteries, it's quite freeing in the sense that they seem to be finding their own way to, you know, to present the practices and the teachings. And it's very much more based on the suttas than it is on Thai traditions or culture. So a lot of the kind of Thai conventions are really starting to fade away a little bit more. And, you know, Ajahn Brahmali is an expert in the Vinaya, so he sort of analyzes that and sees which bits are you know, cultural add-ons and which bits are actually authentic parts of the Vinaya. So um, that's the code of discipline. W will there be bhikkhunis in Thailand and Burma? There are. There are, are bhikkhunis yeah. in Thailand, but in Burma it's much harder because it's an imprisonable offence to be a bhikkhuni. I heard only of one bhikkhuni who actually went back there and, uh, and was in prison, so I don't think people are very eager to do that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but in, in Thailand there are there in are Thailand there are bhikkhuni monasteries, but as I understand it, they need to go out of Thailand to take the ordination because there aren't okay. any Thai monks who do it. But but they are but they are, are allowing them two to do or that, three. I mean, I don't know that they or whoever they are are allowing them. I think for women, they just need to do it, you mm. know. And if they get on with it quietly and live a virtuous life with that confidence that they're following the teachings, then. People develop respect for them, and bit by bit they become accepted in society, slowly. and that has a ripple effect. Yeah. So I know that in one monastery, you know, some of the senior monks in that province do support the bikinis. Um But yeah, I think eventually it will become less and less relevant whether the monks support us or not, because we support us, mm. and lay people support us, and you know, what does it matter to the monks whether we think they're, you know, whether we support them? It doesn't. Mm. We have to just get on with it. But in Burma, it's an imprisonment offence. Yes. Quite, I do remember picking up a Burmese meditation manual and it started off saying the qualities or something required for enlightenment and one was to be a human and the second was to be a man. Mm, totally thought, goes against the Buddha's teachings because, I mean, throughout the suttas you hear so exactly, many yeah. you know, cases of women being enlightened and sometimes mm. there are teachings by bhikkhuni nuns. There's one called um, Venerable Dhammadinna and she has a sutta in the in the, uh, I forget which uh, book, but she answers various questions that are put to her in very deep subjects. And the Buddha said, yes, I approve, that's exactly how I would have answered it myself. 
you know, and she was enlightened, fully enlightened. So it's just not true. You mm. need to go to the suttas to, mm. you know, get past that sort of yeah. <laughs> no, superstition that's yeah. come around through misogyny and patriarchy. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well. <laughs> the thing is, you can't stop people with the aspiration to practice. They'll find a way. Yeah, somehow they will. Yeah. 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 C- can you? Can you? Say the name of your project. I, I think it'd yeah. be nice for people to be able to have access okay. to a website or some yeah, more information sure. on how they could follow up on what you're doing. Yeah, and yeah. So our project is called Anu Kampa Bikuni Project. So Anu Kampa is A N U N U K A M P A. A N U K M P A. Yes. Um, and if you look for Anu Kampa Project dot org, that's our website. So you All can right. find us online. Yeah. So and if you're a webmaster, you can help us with the web content too, because it's been pretty uh, stagnant for the last few years. <laughs> I'll try and get. But yeah, you can find all our events on there—the yeah. teaching okay. events of my teacher and myself, and uh, basically how we started and um, what we hope to do, and who's involved in the project, and then some regular news updates as to how far we've got and what we continue to do. So, so at the moment you're looking, you're looking for obviously donations, but you're also yeah. looking for help in other ways. So yeah. Techie yeah. help and yeah. And I think you mentioned you. you techie help. Do you still want guests coming to help here? Definitely, yeah. Okay, so you'd like. I guests. mean, the ideal thing, of course, is to find somebody who wants to be involved in the project in a longer term way and who maybe has the aspiration to live in community. But I think you know that's not the kind of thing you can advertise for because it's it's often a very specific fit. You know, you're giving up so much of your life and you're coming to live with, like, one bikini. There needs to be a very special spiritual friendship there, Mm. otherwise it's not going to be supportive on either part. Something that might happen more organically than anything. Sorry? Might might happen more organically than anything. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it has to. Yeah, it has to. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I guess just be kind to yourself. (laughs) That's a pretty nice yeah. thing to add, yeah. And being kind will give you confidence, you know, in your own um, goodness. And from that you can do many more things than you think possible. How do you mean by being confident in your own goodness? I guess, like, when people begin on the path, you know, they're sometimes looking for guidelines as to how to live a good life, and that's what can sometimes happen with Vinaya, you know. It's like, tell me what to do so I can do it, because I'm not quite sure of my own like ability to gauge what's ethically sound or not and the more you cultivate that within your heart the more kind of you live it and you know and you're able to live from your heart in a way that has integrity and authenticity and that gives a lot of inner confidence and and i I think part of kindness is being ethical isn't it it's agreeing to not do harm that's the whole particularly to ourselves so that's yeah. kindness, isn't it? it so is yeah, kindness. so yeah, you would become more confident mm, in your own mm, mm, mm. ethical behaviour through right. being kind to yourself. Right. Lovely. That's yeah. a really yeah. simple, yeah. love, nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So be be more kind to yourself. Yeah, you can never be too kind. So <laughs> something I always ask at the end of a end of a podcast: What would you now say to give to your say to your nineteen or twenty year old self? Oh, what gosh. advice would you give? Go for it. <laughs> Trust your intuition and don't be afraid to explore. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very awesome. much. That was wonderful. Thank you so lovely. much for sharing that. Thank that you was, very that much. That was a really interesting really talk. Really lovely to talk to you. And thanks no, for thank your you. very probing and interesting questions. You've made me think. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> That's good. Thank Brilliant. you. Take care. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to know more about me and what I do, please check out my website, www.monkonamotorbike. Thanks for listening. Bye.